Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, think I'm going to get started because I have a lot to say, <laughs> and I don't want to cut too much into Rich's time. Um, so welcome to the 15th annual Evelyn Galman Spritz Endowed Lecture. Um, I hope all of you had a chance to pick up the brochure for today's lecture. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tamim Sheikh. I'm the current director of the Human Medical Genetics and Genomics PhD program. Um, so I would like to begin by telling you a little bit about our benefactor, Evelyn Spritz, whose support has helped establish this lectureship, uh, which over the years has been, attracted a lot of great speakers who have all been or currently are leaders in the field of genetics and genomics. And all of the speakers from the past are listed in the back of this brochure for you to see. Um, so e Evelyn actually is a very uh, interesting. She has a great uh, number of interests. And she takes a great interest in this particular lectureship because I've been here nine years, and I can tell you that it's very rare that she's not here during this annual lecture. And I think the only one she missed was because of a medical thing where she had a surgery. So it is great to see her come to this uh, seminar. And she also has many other interests, as you will see in the brochure. Um, and she actually is a, an absolute delight to be with and to hang out with at the after seminar dinners, which I have attended many of. Uh, <laughs> so like previous years, she's here today in the audience. So I would like to welcome her. And today is especially a very special one for her because today the person we are honoring happens to be her son, Dr. Richard Spritz. Uh, and we are going to talk about his, uh, to be here to celebrate his amazing scientific career. Uh, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank Evelyn again for establishing this wonderful lectureship. And at the same time, also thank you for nurturing and encouraging Rich's scientific pursuits, even when he was a young man, despite the chemistry set incident that we've heard about. Uh, so now moving on to the guest of honor today, Dr. Rich Spritz. Uh, you will shortly hear more about Rich's scientific journey and his many, many accomplishments in science. Uh, but right now, I would like to speak a little bit about uh, his immense contributions to the human medical genetics and genomics program and to this research community uh, on this campus. So Rich came to see you in 1998 while the campus was still downtown. And he established the Human Medical Genetics Program with the goal of coordinating a wide range of activities that support genetics and genomics, and then to provide leadership and vision to the larger research community with regards to activities around medical genetics, genomics, and other related fields. And he has actively supported the service, education, and research mission of the Human Medical Genetics Program for 20 plus years since his arrival here. Uh, in addition to that, he's also established the Human Medical Genetics and Genomics PhD Program, which I currently direct, having taken over the reins from Rich just a year and a half ago. And I can tell you that my transition into this role has been very easy because Rich established this program and all the great resources which make this program thrive, including the excellent seminar series that we all be, have become part of, including this lectureship, uh, uh, the annual retreat, which has been an amazing thing for the faculty and students of our program, and the very strong curriculum for our PhD graduate students. So thank you, Rich, for doing this and allowing me to take on this uh, role and hit the ground running. Uh, on a more personal note, 
I think Rich played a very important role in my recruitment to this campus. And I can tell you that his presence and his being here was one of the bigger reasons for me being attracted to come to this campus. So, and he's been, since I've been here, he's been a great colleague and a mentor to me. And uh, I will talk a little bit more about his mentorship because that seems to be the common theme. Whenever you talk to anybody who's trained with Rich, the only thing you hear is how excellent he is as a mentor and a teacher. And just today, I received a letter from Dr. Lee, who is a, now a professor at Yonsei University in Seoul, South Korea, who just, I think he had like three or four pages just talking about what Rich's mentorship has meant to him and his current success in science. And so we thought, what a great way to do this if we can have one of his mentees introduce him today and talk about all of his scientific accomplishments as well as his mentorship and what it has meant to them. So to do this honor today, I invite Dr. Gregory LaBerge, who did his graduate work in Rich's lab, graduating in 2011, and is currently a director in the Denver uh, Police uh, Forensics and Evidence Division. And he also has an adjoint appointment as associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics here. So without further ado, Greg. I made my own presentation for this. <laughs> well, I have the distinct honor of uh, presenting this young man. Uh, some great slides here. Um, Dr. Spritz got his bachelor's degree in 1972 in zoology um, from the University of Wisconsin. I don't know which one of those. That's not the pictures on the right, and certainly not the picture on the left. He's a handsome young guy there. Um, and I, and I was told if the, the, the picture on the right is bro cream, you can't really read it there. And I didn't know if that was for the center or for the sides, but I, you can maybe help us in your lecture with that. The interesting thing about, about Rich's undergrad was that he started his, his exploration of genetics rather early. Uh, he started with James Crow at Wisconsin and got his first exposure in the form of genomic DNA hybridization studies as an undergraduate. So almost right away, he's into the field of genetics. He goes off to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Perlman School of Medicine. And interestingly, during his medical career, there was a, a program where they had problem-solving projects as part of the medical curriculum. So many students when they did their problem-solving projects, would interview each other or talk about their lives. And Rich, uh, <laughs> Rich chose to do his, his problem-solving project on the Epstein-Barr virus and herpes simplex 5 viruses <laughs> as a medical student. So in addition to his medical studies, he was off studying um, virology, which is quite impressive. In his fourth year of medical school at Pennsylvania, he worked with Dr. William Melman on somatic cell hybridization mapping projects. In addition to his medical studies and during his internship and residency in pediatrics uh, at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, he launched a self-driven research project into eye cell disease in addition to his residency. The head of the hospital at the time provided Rich with the laboratory space or a sandbox to do his science in. So from an early age, he understood that he was going to be a physician scientist. In 1978, he went to Yale to work with Sherm Weissman and Bernard Forget. At his request, he worked on the hardest project in science at the time, which was the characterization of genes in uh, the beta globin family. And he went on to describe the first genetic mutation in a clone gene underlying beta thalassemia, which was published in 1981 in PNAS. He, no surprise, got his first faculty position very quickly after at Wisconsin, where he rose from assistant professor to professor. And he came to CU in 1998 to start the Human Medical Genetics Program, which is where I met Rich. His work included the study of human genetic disorders from thalassemia, albinism to cleft lip and palate, and of course, his famous vitiligo studies. Um, he's an intrepid explorer. I think that 
One of the things you'll, you'll note when you know Rich is that nothing is, is within bounds. He's always out of bounds. From things submicroscopic to the heights of El Capitan, the Iger, Denali, and others. He's also a fantastic mentor. We all think differently because of Rich. Um, his intelligence, his work ethic, pushed us harder. We thought deeper and we were forced, in many ways forced, to develop a better sense of personal responsibility to improve. I can attest to that. Above all, we were encouraged to explore our natural environment all around us and were consistently inspired by his adventures. As always, Diana's by his side and I would really like to welcome at this point Dr. Richard Spritz to the lecture. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah great. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, my mom has already been thanked. I'd like to thank her for um, both endowing the lecture and endowing me, because if it weren't for her, I wouldn't be here or anywhere else today. So thank you. <laughs> um, and Greg's already given some of what I was going to talk about, which is sort of my trajectory in science over the years. And I. It's been a little more than 40 years uh, wandering in the genomic wilderness. And there are a lot of people watching this around the world. Uh, many of my former students and postdocs uh, in other continents, other time zones. Um, and I, want to, I talked about wandering in the genome. And uh, for the non-scientists, in humans, the genome, which means the genetic material of an organism, is about 3 million base pairs. Uh, distributed among 23 pairs of chromosomes, encoding somewhere around 19 to 20,000 genes. We really don't know the exact number. But back in 1969, when I started learning genetics, genome wasn't a word that people used, because there really wasn't any point. We didn't know anything about genes, really, much less about genomes. Um, and now the challenge is going to be, can I really make this work? Yeah. Oh, no. The other way. So much for that. And my first, as Greg said, my first exposure to genetics was a genetic, a very famous genetics course taught by Jim Crow, who asked uh, to become my undergraduate mentor. Then I did a project with Jim on DNA hybridization. And um, in those days, we didn't have access to genomes. We had access to DNA. People would hybridize DNA to itself or to DNA of another organism. And depending on how fast it hybridized and what the pattern was, you could make inferences about how far apart evolutionarily those organisms were. Um, and so you're going to see uh, another of a tree, evolutionary tree like that, that's a little bit different. Um, and uh, Jim gave the first Evelyn Spritz lecture in 2001. I'm very honored to host him for that. Um, when I was a medical student, as Greg said, I did a problem-solving project rather than giving a questionnaire to six of my friends, like my roommate did. Um, I spent two years doing tumor virology in the lab of my randomly assigned uh, med school advisor, Ron Glazer. Uh, I just learned in preparing for this lecture that Ron passed away about two and a half weeks ago. And I have no idea if he knows that I he knew that I became a physician scientist, so that was always the plan. Um, and I did interact with his wife after uh, learning about his death. And the most amazing thing I did, really, is that after uh, two years of essentially bathing in herpes, high titer stocks of herpes simplex virus, as an adult, I have a herpes titer of zero. Um, we mouth pipetted in those days. Uh, <laughs> um, my first really serious exposure to human genetics came with Bill Melman in 1975 at Penn. Um, and in those days, we didn't have our hands on genes, but people were mapping genes to human chromosomes by using what were called somatic cell hybrids. And you could measure the enzymatic activity of cells that had an extra chromosome, for example, or were missing part of a chromosome. And based on changes in the enzymatic activity, you could infer locations of genes. And we did that to map uh, the gene for glutamic oxalic transaminase 1 uh, on chromosome uh, 10. 
Um, while an intern and resident at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I saw a patient with a very, very new and rare disease called eye cell disease, a lysosomal storage disease, and I was interested in that, came up with a research project, um, and went to the head of the hospital, Gene Cortner, and asked whether I could sort of play in his lab uh, doing this project while I was running around uh, on call at night uh, waiting for lab results and the like. And Paul Coates helped me in that. And the amazing thing was that it actually worked. And we wound up disproving a hypothesis as to the cause of eye cell disease, um, the cause of which, actual cause of which was discovered later. Um, and when I went to Yale as a uh, postdoc, um, again, for clinical training and for research training, I had the amazing fortune to work with Sherman Weissman and Bernie Forget. And that was a time and I asked for and was given what I think was one of the most important projects in the world at the moment, which was the first isolation of human genes and characterization of human genes. And we worked um, with uh, a, gar- a worldwide c- a group um, and I worked on the, both the delta and beta globin gene uh, in the normal, and uh, you can see now, whoops, another evolutionary tree. This is the first one that is based on DNA sequences, and though I'm about sixth author on that paper, I actually worked, uh, I was co-first author in reality. Um, and then ultimately, uh, we, hmm, this isn't so easy. Okay, let's do this. Um, and then at the same time, I was working on an, the first abnormal gene. And this was a gene from a patient with beta thalassemia, and we found the first mutation in any cloned isolated gene, which happened to be the first splicing mutation. And that led me then at Wisconsin to work on globin genes and RNA splicing for a number of years. And Oliver Smithies, who was my faculty big brother, um, about 1985 or so said to me, you know, you're doing good stuff, but, you know, you're competing with Nobel Prize winners, and is that really serious, what you want to do? And anyway, you're not really making use of your MD, and maybe you might want to do something more medically relevant. And I took that to heart, um, and very weirdly had a dream, literally, um, in 1985, about identifying the gene for albinism. And it was a good enough idea that I sat up in bed and wrote it down and we even, and wasted one postdoc year trying to do it. Um, but ultimately, we were successful. Now, um, disorders of pigmentation were the first genetic diseases ever recognized because of the obvious phenotype. They're sort of of interest to the general public because people who have them are recognizable and there are many animals that are albino. And so they've seen that. Uh, Most of them are single gene Mendelian disorders, just one gene is involved. Um, They were the first genetic diseases for which patterns of inheritance were recognized, for which pedigrees were presented, a first genetic disease for which a deficiency of an enzyme function was identified. And as I said, there are many homologies in animal systems. And so this is, for example, this particular family, the Lucassi family of albinos, was one of the premier uh, exhibits, if you will, um, for uh, P.T. Barnum and uh, then later other uh, sideshows um, well into the 20th century. Their career spanned more than 60 years. Um, so this is something that people are interested in, but there really wasn't very much known at the time that we started in 1986. Um, well, we did pretty well, I think. Um, so that it led to a pretty remarkable 15-year period with numerous papers in high-impact journals, New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, uh, and yeah, Nature Genetics, and others. And I want to mention two people that were important. Um, Vince Hearing at the NIH, with whom I collaborated on a large number of functional studies of various genes, albinism, piebaldism, uh, Hermansky-Pudlock syndrome, and uh, Chediakagashi syndrome, and Dick Swank, a fabulous collaborator um, who assured me that he is very much enjoying spending his days fishing at the moment. Um, and uh, so I think that was a really fun time. Um, but in the middle of that period, one of my functional study collaborators, Dot Bennett in England, kept bugging me to, as she put it, get involved with vitiligo. She'd been put up to this by Maxine Witten, um, who was at that time president of the Vitiligo Society in London, and who in 2013 was uh, became awarded member of the, it's not member of the British, 
Now, there's another word in there, but anyway, member of the British Empire is good enough, um, for her help to people with vitiligo, largely by proselytizing. And so at, around 1996 and 7, as the Genome Project began to get going, I said, well, if we're going to do this, because it means a mushy disease, it's not a single gene disease, and we don't really know how to do these kinds of things. But as it became clear how you might approach working on a complex disease, I said, well, Dot, if we're going to do it, let's do it right. And so we sent out a questionnaire to the entire membership of the Vitiligo Society, the entire membership of the National Vitiligo Foundation in the United States, got back something like 5,000 responses um, and we use those not only to gain information about the disease, but also to identify families with multiple affected relatives, because that's what we needed back then to try to identify genes by genetic linkage. And again, that's been pretty successful. Um, I want to mention a couple of remarkable collaborators, um, Pam Fain, uh, and later Stephanie Santorico, who isn't here because she had surgery the other day. I um, hope she's listening, and Charles DiNarello, who I see sitting there in the second row. So people that have really been instrumental, I think, in uh, adding to our knowledge about vitiligo. And I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about it um, because it's a model complex disease. I think that what we found for vitiligo pertains to pretty much every other complex disease in one way or another, be it diabetes or hypertension or heart disease. Um, and as I've often said, something had to be easiest. It turned out to be vitiligo. We got really lucky. That is, the impact of any given genetic change in vitiligo is about twice that of the typical complex disease. And so with a relatively limited amount of NIH money and effort, um, we got, we've gotten very, very far, as I think you'll see. So just to give you a, a quick uh, review, um, the disease involves acquired patches of white skin, um, and that's due to loss of melanocytes in the skin, pigment cells, by immune killing, killing by T cells. It's not super rare or super common, has a prevalence of about 0.4% in Europeans, um, roughly, oh, I have this twice, roughly similar frequency in males and females. Um, and it, as I said, is what we call genetically complex, which is the modern word for what we used to say polygenic and multifactorial. And I have a lot more to say about that. Heritability, how important genes are, again, I'll have more to say about. Somewhere between about half and 75% of the risk for vitiligo is due to genes. Um, the concordance in monozygotic twins, if one has it, does the other get it? It's about 45%, so fairly high. Um, risk to first-degree relatives, siblings, parents, children, is about 6 to 7%, so much lower than in twins. And the vast majority, about 91% of cases, are sporadic. Patients don't have any other affected relatives. But about 9% of them do have other affected relatives, and in the beginning, that's what we were really looking for. So that's what we needed to try to find genes. At this point, we've identified 52 contributory genetic loci on different chromosomes in European-derived white patients. Um, and again, I'll have a bit more to say about that. So um, the history of vitiligo, I like history a lot, as you'll find out. Um, it was first reported in 1765 by Claude Nicolas Lacat, I guess. My mother will correct me, she being a Francophone, uh, if I'm wrong. Um, and the first really important observation scientifically was made by Moritz Kaposi, about whom I'll also say more shortly, who was a professor of the, at the head and skin clinic, he was head of the skin clinic, the University of Vienna. And what he described is that in the skin of people with vitiligo, their normal skin appears normal, that has these pigmented cells that we now call melanocytes, but inside the lesion, adjacent, there aren't any melanocytes. So this was the first observation. So these are the melanocytes. They are cells derived from the neural crest. Um, and they synthesize pigment, melanin, on specialized organelles called melanosomes. These are related to lysosomes. And then the melanosome bearing its pigment is transferred out of the keratinocyte into adjacent cells. I'm sorry, out of the melanocyte into adjacent cells, the keratinocyte, where the melanocyte, the melanin is then deposited. So that's how you get pigment 
into your skin. And that process of transfer goes more quickly if it's exposed, you're exposed to UV. That's how you get a tan. Okay. Now, a really important observation was made in 1855 by Thomas Addison in his original monograph describing what's called Addison's disease, adrenal insufficiency, mostly these days of which is due to autoimmune loss of adrenal cells. But in his papers, most of his patients had tuberculosis, which killed off their adrenal gland, and they died because of adrenal failure. But two of his patients were different. And this is his illustration of one of that, those two patients. He said the other one looked exactly the same. And those two patients had Addison's disease, adrenal insufficiency. They also had something that he called Addisonian anemia, now called pernicious anemia, another autoimmune disease. And they died of that. And they had vitiligo. So this juxtaposition of multiple different autoimmune diseases, but similar, not random, in terms of what they were, was a really important observation. And 100 years later, Robert de Mowbray decided to call these autoimmune. And he noted that there was a familial incidence, that people tended to have relatives with similar kinds of diseases. And in that survey that we did of the vitiligo society in the beginning, what we found was that about if you look at people with vitiligo, about 21% of them have some other autoimmune disease, mostly autoimmune thyroid disease, but also diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, pernicious anemia, which we've already mentioned, Addison's disease, lupus, much rarer diseases, and so their prevalence is lower. And the other thing we saw is that the close relatives of people with vitiligo also have an increased risk of these same diseases, even if they don't have vitiligo. In other words, there seems to be a genetic predisposition in these families for all of these diseases. And that the rough prevalence among the people in these families was similar to, excuse me, was um, similar to their overall prevalence in the population, just higher. Now, the next thing I want to mention is this gentleman, Gunter Stuttgen. He was a dermatologist in Germany. In 1950, he published the first analysis family of um, study of vitiligo. And this, this is the family that he showed. And this family had both autoimmune thyroid disease and vitiligo. And he said something fairly brilliant in his paper written in German. He postulated that this family involved simultaneous co-inheritance of both recessive and dominant factors to account for the diseases in the family. And to my knowledge, that's the first mention of what we would now call complex inheritance. So I think that was really pretty cool. And he did another really cool thing. A few years before, he was Kapitän Gunter Schuttgen in the Wehrmacht um, in the medical corps. And in the run-up to the Battle of the Bulge, things were going very badly for the Americans. And on his own volition, he engineered a series of truces um, in which physicians uh, of both sides went out onto the battlefield to care for patients regardless of what uniform they were wearing. There's now a monument to him at the site. For doing this, uh, Hitler uh, sentenced him to death in absentia, but because it was near the end of the war, then there was so much confusion, he never got caught. Um, So I think quite a remarkable thing to have done. Now... The last thing I'm going to talk about in terms of history of vitiligo is the role of environmental triggers. You're not born with vitiligo. It happens to you at some point in your life. I'd already mentioned Moritz Kaposi. He, another physician in the same department, was Heinrich Kebner, kind of a wild man apparently, and he described for psoriasis the occurrence of new lesions at sites of skin trauma, any kind of skin trauma. In this case, it's a a, a tattoo. Kaposi extended that to almost all diseases that involve inflammation or immunity of the skin, and he also extended the range of the kinds of skin trauma that were involved, be it sunburn. Now, the interesting thing is they worked under this guy here, Hebra. Hebra's actual name was Ferdinand Karl Franz Schwarzman, but he really liked Jewish people. He wasn't Jewish, he was Catholic. 
And so he dropped the Karl Franz Schwarzman and became Ferdinand Ritter von Hebra. Ritter means knight in German, like Sir Galahad type knight. So he was the knight of the Jews. He was the only person that would hire Jewish physicians. And he hired both Kebner and Kaposi, except Kaposi's name at that point was Cohen. Cohen. And, but Cohen fell in love with Hebra's daughter, and so he converted to Catholicism to marry Kebner, uh, Hebra's daughter. They had five children, so apparently it worked. Um, and uh, changed his name to Kaposi. I don't remember the name, but it, the town he was from was very similar to the name Kaposi. So that's sort of his whole thing. And of course, he's very famous for Kaposi's sarcoma that is very well known, particularly associated with HIV. So induction of skin lesions by skin damage. Now I'm going to summarize 22 years of work on vitiligo genetics, take you back to 1997 when we started. Bill Clinton was starting his second term. Portia won at Le Mans. Um, the Mars Pathfinder and Sojourner rover were the first uh, rover outside of the Earth-Moon orbit. Uh, and I won't say anything more about that. Um, and the second family that we found in this big survey that we did was this family that had 13 members of the family affected with vitiligo. And that family alone was big enough to do a linkage study. We found a very significant LOD score on chromosome 1 um, and estimated a penetrance of about 0.5. Here's one of the affected members of the family. And in this sort of pre-genome project era, we cloned and sequenced that whole region of the chromosome and found that that family had a private mutation in the promoter of FOXD3, which is the master regulator of melanocyte differentiation. And what that mutation did was increase expression by 50% in cells that expressed the endogenous gene. And from studies in uh, frogs, it was known that would reduce the number of melanocytes pretty significantly. So this family probably doesn't have very melanocytes, to, many melanocytes to start with. If there's damage, they lose some. That explains the vitiligo, but it didn't explain the fact that there were other autoimmune diseases in this family, the same ones that other patients with vitiligo get. So I want you to tuck that fact lit away. Of course, we buried that fact in the paper. We didn't bring that up. But um, we then went on to now more typical studies for complex diseases. This started in the mid-2000s, doing genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. Ying Jin uh, took the lead on this in my lab. And um, we found 50 common vitiligo loci in Caucasians. We've done other studies in patients from India, Pakistan, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, but the, the big results have come from studies of Caucasians, and that's what I'll talk about. So there are, among all of these peaks, 50 that are statistically significant. And those 50 loci, the ones that we're sure what the genes are, encode a number of genes, many of which we are old friends, we know a lot about. These are melanocyte proteins like tyrosinase, the things that came out of our studies of albinism. These are the antigens. These are what um, stimulate immunity and what T cells use to recognize the target cell melanocytes. And then there are um, genes involved in antigen presentation. There are genes involved in innate immunity. A lot of them have to do with cytotoxic T cells, the cells that do the killing of the target. And then a number of them have to do with cell death, and we're not quite sure how they fit in exactly yet. Um, but this gives us sort of a, a functional blueprint of how, what the disease might be. And that gives us sort of a pathophysiologic blueprint, the idea being that you program your immune system in the thymus, and you generate T cell precursors that come out into the circulation. Um, there's damage to the skin. Um, you kill some melanocytes. They um, have, present antigens on their surfaces, or you damage the melanocytes. Uh, there are signals that attract uh, dendritic cells. The antigens are picked up by the dendritic cells and ultimately are presented to immature T cells. And if it, everything clicks, then they become uh, mature cytotoxic T cells, which go off in search of the antigens. And when they find them, they kill the target. So that's sort of the way we think that things, in a very broad sense, work. In addition, many of the genes that we found for vitiligo have also been found 
in other GWAS of the other autoimmune diseases that are epidemiologically associated with vitiligo, so type 1 diabetes. Vitiligo looks a lot like type 1 diabetes, except that in type 1 diabetes, the antigen is insulin, um, and in uh, vitiligo, it's mostly tyrosinase and other melanocyte proteins. But many of the other genes are the same ones. And not, not just the same ones, they're the same variations in the genes that seem to be predisposing to both sets of diseases, and et cetera, for thyroid disease, for celiac disease, and others. And so now we do have this idea that they're among these um, epidemiologically associated autoimmune diseases. There are genes in common, perhaps to all, and then there are some specific genes and environmental triggers, which are generally unknown, that lead to one or the other disease actually occurring in a given person who's genetically predisposed. So at that point in 2016, where we had 50-ish genes, I said, that's enough. If we can't make sense of this, we don't deserve any more NIH grant dollars that we need to spend our efforts on figuring out how this all fits together. And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time doing. And I don't have a, I don't see a clock, so I don't know. 25. Okay, fine. I'm going to talk about four fitting it all together topics. One is vitiligo heritability. The second is vitiligo genetic architecture. How does it fit together? Third is subgroups and underlying genetic architecture. And the last are environmental triggers, which appear to be changing. So start with heritability. How much do genes actually matter? We spent all this effort finding genes. So this has been done in my lab by Jen Roberts, who's somewhere out there, um, and, <laughs> and Stephanie Santorico. Um, and so Jen's done a twin study, and she finds that genes matter about half. Uh, and a lot depends on how you measure and how you, what, what you mean by heritability. I'm not going to worry about that, really. Um, from first-degree relative studies, it um, seems to matter a bit more, maybe 80%. From other people's studies of bigger families, seems to be somewhere between about 50 and 80%. So we're in the range. Um, from the GWAS, where you can calculate how much the SNPs that you found in given genes matter, about 80%, so somewhere between about 50 and 80% seems to be how much genes matter. But both genes and the environment matter to some extent. And that's something that I'm going to talk about more in a moment. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is some terrific studies that Jen Roberts has done on genetic architecture, and which she'll be talking about in her PhD defense on June 30th, June something, something like that, the end of June. So I want to just acquaint you, if you don't know, with the, what's called the liability threshold model. And it's a pretty simple idea. And that is that people in a population, shown by this distribution here, have differing amounts of risk for whatever. We're talking about vitiligo. So you have the sum of, more or less the sum, of your genetic risk and the environmental risk. And if your total risk is, goes over some biological threshold, then you get vitiligo or diabetes or whatever, okay? More genetic risk you have, the less environmental risk stuff, bad triggers have to happen to push you over the threshold. But, so these are the guys that have made it over the threshold, however they got there. Now, a question that I'd wondered about ever since I was a medical student and had seen families with multiple cases of autoimmune diseases, and then a NIH grant reviewer raised in, when we submitted our very first grant proposal in 1987 was, you're proposing to study families that have multiple affected relatives, but most people don't have multiple affected relatives. So how do you know that what you're going to find from studying the, 92, the 8% of cases that are familial, or what we call multiplex, how do you know that has anything to do with the sporadic cases that are the vast majority? And we excited us, and, you know, that's kind of what we can do at this point. So anyway, the reviewers bought it, and off, we were off to the races. So here's a, an extreme family. This is that family I showed you before with multiplex vitiligo, lots of affected relatives. Here's a simplex case where they don't have any affected relatives that they, don't, that they know about. Um, and so how does this relate to the other, not only occurrence of vitiligo, but also other autoimmune diseases in these same people and families? Here's what our families actually look like. This is 4,200 or so, 4,500 
unaffected probands, meaning contact people in a family. So about 92% of them have no affected relatives. About 4% have one affected relative, uh, usually a sibling or an affected parent or an affected child. About 4% come from somewhat larger families, a few affected family members, but try as we will to expand beyond that. We don't find anyone else affected. And then, as I said, there's that one family that's kind of extreme, so whatever that is, it's rare. And so you could imagine that those fit together in different ways to cause disease. You could imagine that disease could be what we call polygenic, lots of genes involved in any given person, each with a small effect. Or you could imagine, like that big family, one gene accounts for most of the story in that family. And then you can imagine in between things that are almost one gene, monogenic, Mendelian, or things that are a few genes, and proportionately they would have to have bigger effects the fewer genes were involved. So the GWAS genes that we found, GWAS loci, are common and mostly have small effects. And so what Jen did with the 50 loci risk genes that came out of the GWAS is put them all together, and you weight them based on the effect size that they have in the GWAS, and you build what's called a risk score. And so this is a polygenic risk score. It's assuming that they all add up, basically, um, and that's how you treat it. And when she did that, what she found was that, indeed, cases have a lot more risk from these GWAS loci overall than unaffected controls. They kind of had to, because that's how you found them. Um, and, but that the difference was pretty big. It was one standard deviation, which is a big difference as things go. Uh, oops, this is really sensitive. Okay, so again, then the idea would be that you could have in these Families with lots of affected relatives, one gene that was most of the action, you would find those by linkage analysis. That's how we found that FOXD3 gene in that one family. Or at the other end of the spectrum, people that don't have any affected relatives, they just have a lot of little risks that's kind of adding up. And these are the loci, that were 50 loci that came out of the GWAS. And that would be measured by the polygenic risk score because that's where those came from. They didn't come out of this. So the idea would be then that if we look at big families, those would have a low score coming from these loci over here that came out of the GWAS. And if we look at singleton individuals, they would have high risk coming from these because that's those are the people that we found them from. And Jen and I had sort of a bet going as to what was going to happen when she actually did the analysis. I won. Um, <laughs> she's laughing. Um, but there was nothing actually staked on this except our reputations. Um, so what she found was really exciting. What she found was that if you look at the patients who have no affected relatives versus the patients that have multiple affected relatives, that the people who have multiple affected relatives have a higher score, risk score coming from the genes that mostly were found in people who don't have affected relatives. In other words, these same polygenic GWAS loci play roles in the bigger multiplex family as well as in the singleton cases. When she looked at these bigger families in more detail, what she found was that the unaffected relatives transmitted more polygenic risk to their affected offspring than... um, than was expected by chance. So the the vitiligo in the multiplex families involves the same common polygenic risk alleles that you see in the simplex singleton sporadic cases. So then she went into even more detail, and she took one member of each family, and she calculated the risk score, and then she assigned them based on how many affected relatives people were in the family. And what she found was pretty simple. The more affected members in the family, the higher the risk score. They got more unlucky in the gene pool. Okay, they got more genetic risk by chance that is segregating in their families. And then she asked an amazing question. 
And so, so that says that all this part of things is wrong. It's all, this is the answer to all kinds of vitiligo, that it's polygenic. And she said, well, what about that one family that we found a gene in, that they had a unique variant in that gene, nobody else has it, okay, in FOXD3. And she went, because that we would have thought would be somewhat over here. And what she did was she went back to that family, and what she found was that that family has one of the highest risk scores of all. They got super unlucky in the gene pool. They got a lot of common risk that's out there in the general population, plus they got a FOXD3 variant that itself is a big whammy and that accounts for a lot more risk. And so this, that's why they have 13 affected relatives. That's FOXD3 and the other loci. And all those other loci that contribute to vitiligo and other autoimmune diseases finally explains why that family has all those other autoimmune diseases besides vitiligo. Um, And so it was really a very, very cool finding that they have both the high penetrance FOXD3 mutation and a high load of common vitiligo variants. So in vitiligo, there's a polygenic architecture in both simplex cases and in the multiplex families. And if we were to look in the other multiplex families by sequencing their genomes, which we're doing, then we might find other rare variants that we don't find in simplex families, but it's going to be really hard to identify them. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is vitiligo subgroups and how that relates to the architecture in different subgroups. And there aren't many clinical subgroups in vitiligo. Patients kind of look the same, um, and though the dermatologists talk about some differences between them, I'm not convinced that those are real biologic differences um, that reflect underlying genetics. But one thing that had always bothered me, going all the way back to the original uh, survey that we had done with the Vitiligo Society, was that when we graphed age of onset of vitiligo, that's the blue bars, you get sort of a lumpy distribution. It doesn't look like a, literally, a normal distribution. And when uh, Ying and Stephanie Santorico did formal analyses of the structure it was best explained by two overlapping distributions. In other words, that there's an early onset subgroup and a late onset subgroup, very analogous to type 1 diabetes. And that the early onset subgroup was about a third of cases, and the late onset was about two-thirds of cases. And that the difference in age of onset was pretty big, 10 years versus 34 years. And it was the same in males and females. So... um, The other thing that was interesting was that when we looked at the patients that we could sort of assign to the two subgroups with reasonable certainty, patients at the extremes, there was a pretty big difference in how often those patients had other autoimmune diseases. I thought that the patients with early onset would have more other autoimmune diseases because they just had more bad genetic stuff going on. It was the opposite. That In fact, they had fewer other autoimmune diseases, 17% in the early onset group versus 22% in the late onset group, and the difference was highly significant. So I wasn't sure what that was about. Um, But what we did was we went back to our existing GWAS data, and we split our cases, again, in by extremes, early onset, late onset, threw away the ones in the middle. And what we found was that when we looked at the 49 at that point, loci that had come out of the total genome-wide studies, There was no difference between any of those in the early onset versus the late onset cases. But in the specific to the early onset group, there was something new. And that something new is incredibly significant. P value is 10 to the minus 54. And the effect was huge. The odds ratio was over almost five. And it wasn't super rare. It had a frequency of about three and a half percent. So what is that? And it turns out that it's a variant in an enhancer in the major histocompatibility complex class II region. Now, we already had the most common major variant in the genome for vitiligo, what we call the generic class II variant, in the MHC class II region, also in an enhancer. And this is work we did with Charles DiNarello that affects expression of genes in this region a little. This variant is way far away over here, and the two are 
with this one always occurs on the chromosomal background, the haplotype of this one. In other words, it's a double-hit chromosome. And when we looked at the frequency of that chromosome by age of onset of our total patient population, what you can see is the frequency goes through the roof in people who had onset between about 7 and 12 years of age. Now, there are other people that don't have it that had even earlier onset. I don't know what went on with them. That's a very interesting group for future study. But here are those people that have that chromosome. And they have less frequency of other, early, other autoimmune diseases, but they have very early onset of vitiligo. So what's going on? What's the biology? What's the trigger? And it's dominant. And when we recalculate the odds ratio based on the haplotype, it's greater than 11. I mean, it's really an incredible result. You don't see things like that in complex diseases. Well, let me answer the first thing because it's easy, and that is when we looked at what else is on that haplotype, what we found is that the HLA-DRB1 type on that haplotype is 1301. 1301 is protective for most autoimmune diseases, so not vitiligo apparently, but that probably explains why there's a decreased frequency of other autoimmune diseases because they're getting really ramped up for vitiligo, but they have less risk of other autoimmune diseases due to the 1301. Now, here is the generic enhancer variant. Here's the early onset enhancer variant that we found. They always go together. And what that chromo chromosome does is it increases expression of one of the HLA genes called DQB1, and it increases expression of DQ protein on the relevant cells, professional antigen-presenting cells, monocytes and dendritic cells. It's a really big effect, three, three to five-fold increase, so very big. Um, and so the hypothesis then is that we're upregulating that part of the biology, that the process of moving antigens from dendritic cells to immature T cells is facilitated. And what the antigens are, exactly how the lock and key fit works between uh, the specific DQ molecule that's being expressed and the antigen, we don't know that. But the, the assumption is that somehow that enhances immune triggering and loss of tolerance. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is what is the environment. Um, oh, this isn't right. Okay, forget that. Um, changing environmental triggers. And for about 60 years, the frequency of type 1 diabetes has been increasing by a little over 2% per year. At the same time, the age of onset of type 1 diabetes has been going down. It's happening earlier. And there are two really divergent hypotheses that have been suggested to explain that. And it's less clear for other autoimmune diseases whether the frequency is going up. But for several, it has been suggested that it is. That are less clear, though. Hypothesis one is that called the hygiene hypothesis. We're too clean. We're getting exposed, our first exposure to certain antigens later in life, and we have a different response a little later in life than we would have had had we been exposed earlier, and somehow that leads to autoimmune disease. The exactly opposite hypothesis is that our environment is getting worse. It's getting filled up with all kinds of bad stuff that can act as triggers, we're getting hit with triggers more frequently. And so the likelihood of triggering and the age at which triggering occurs are getting earlier, greater and earlier, respectively. So I said, well, what can we do for vitiligo? We don't have prevalence data for vitiligo, much less longitudinal prevalence data. We do have age of onset data. And so if that holds true, then when really what I expected to see was that the age of onset of vitiligo would have gotten earlier over time, like type 1 diabetes. Absolutely what I thought we'd see. Not true. So this shows you the um, age of onset distribution of patients from North America and Europe from 1951 to 2013 for age of onset. What you see is age of onset was flat until about 1970. In 1970, age of onset started increasing radically by 0.44 years per year, and then it flattened out again in 2004. And so something happened here or earlier that 
led to delayed triggering of vitiligo. In other words, we did something good in our environment, but we don't know what. Um, this is way in excess of the increase in lifespan over that period. So this is not just showing that, oh, people are living later, living longer, and therefore they're getting, have more opportunity to get vitiligo later. This is the distribution of age of onset broken down in those periods, 1951 to 69, 1970 to 2004, 2005 to 13. What you see is that from 1951 to 69, Vitiligo was a pediatric disease. People got it when they were young, age seven, eight, nine, ten. But in that interval, it started to switch. And at this point, it's an adult onset disease. And so the mean age of onset went from 14.7 years to 31.8 years over from 1951 to 2013, more than double, which is great. We've done something good with respect to vitiligo, uh, but I don't know. And there was no change, by the way, with respect to association with HLA. That's not, had nothing to do with it. So now we have mostly late onset cases. Used to be we had mostly early onset cases. And the genes haven't changed. This has to be environmental. So what did we do in that period leading up to 1970 or so? We had a lot of things. The 60s were a time of a lot of attention to our environment. Clean Air Act, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, Water Quality Act, et cetera, et cetera, OSHA. Um, introduction of SPF rating and first effective sunscreens in you know, the 70s. Um, here's one. Start of widespread consumption of yogurt. Maybe we changed our microbiome. There, this is, it was remarkable. People, basically the only people who ate yogurt prior to 1970 live in Tajikistan or someplace like that. And then by 1975, it was prevalent. Um, change from using uh, mercurochrome methylate and iodine to treat skin infections to neosporin, which is much more effective um, and less damaging to the skin. Does that have something? I have no idea. There are some amazing longitudinal studies that have been done in this country, NHANES and before that NHES, where everything was measured in people of all different groups. I don't know how to mine those data, but that would be a natural thing to do, to start looking for candidate things. Um, selenium looked to be a great candidate. Turns out that selenium radically changed in the soil in 1970 in England but so it didn't find its way into wheat, it turns out. So selenium probably isn't the story. Um, so I want to leave us with what I think are some really interesting key kinds of questions for the future. Obviously, more knowledge, new approaches to treatment. Drug companies are all over vitiligo, and they never were before. So increased biologic knowledge has really changed drug company interest. But what are the environmental triggers? We don't really know them for much of anything except celiac disease for autoimmunity. Are there many triggers or just a few? Are the triggers uncommon with high impact or are they common with low impact but their effects cumulative? We don't have any idea. Or is it some of both? Are the triggers the same for, or, diff or different for early onset versus late onset vitiligo? And what I want to leave you with is, I think, really important. The period of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, the period of the genome and the advances in human genetics happened because we have a systematic way to identify genes that are associated with disease and measure their effect. We don't have anything like that to identify environmental triggers for disease. We don't have a science even to identify environmental triggers. It's largely educated guess and test cause and effect, not systematic. And I think that we need a systematic science, and I don't know what that would look like, but to discover environmental impactors for disease. Um, and that, uh, I think, is a very hard kind of problem. So with that, I want to thank um, all the people that have worked in vitiligo in my lab over the years my gazillion collaborators around the world, uh, people that I've worked on with on many, many different things, diseases earlier on in my career, some of whom I think might be listening via Zoom.
Um, and there's none of this, none of us work in a vacuum. None of this could have been done working on my own. All of it involves a lot of people um, working together. And I thank everyone for that. It's been a wild and great fun ride. And so I'll leave you then with this last wandering in the wilderness. <laughs> and I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Greg. <laughs> My mom usually asks the first question. No, 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 please. She's thinking yet. Really good question, and the answer is no. So, when we started this, neither Pam Fain nor I had ever done a questionnaire before. We didn't know what we were doing. We just said, well, what might be important to ask? And we asked what we could. Halfway through, we realized that we had asked the question about diabetes wrong, and we weren't getting the information you really needed, so we changed the questionnaire, but the damage was done at that point. So we changed, we, the questionnaire has evolved. We asked open field questions about what people thought had started their vitiligo. Did they take, you know, what treatments did they use? How did it work? Um, we frankly never asked about smoking, and I wish it, it would have been good. I agree. Yep. Charles. I'm not so sure that yogurt is an environment. <laughs> you have an enormous amount of yogurt to change the microbiome. It doesn't work. It doesn't change your microbiome. But I think the um, sunscreen is a legitimate issue. Because that's damage. And, it, and it, when I was a kid, you know, I was really so dark with Italian skin, so... Um, there was no sunscreen. Send the kids to the beach and you got very dark. Yeah, you put on Johnson's baby oil, which has SPF zero. It was just an issue that no kid had sunscreen. And it's a related Yeah, I mean, I think that's a real possibility. Um, we've done better at preventing sunburn, damaging sunburn. That happened in the 70s, and so onset got later, and then we sort of ran out of that effect, and so it plateaued. Um, when I first start in that open field question, asking people, what do you think caused your vitiligo? You know, you get a lot of kinds of answers, but for sure the most common single answer is I got this blistering sunburn, and then it happened not that long after. And that could be it. Um, it's clearly damaged. One of the most florid cases, you know, I talk to people all the time. It's what I do. And I was uh, uh, going to a meeting, and the bell captain, it's funny, I've seen quite a few bell captains with vitiligo. I don't know if there's a significance to that correlation, but the bell captain had really extensive vitiligo. He was Hispanic, it was obvious. And I asked him, you know, hey, tell me about it. And he said, Doc, this only started six months ago. I play baseball, and I slid into home plate, and I just shredded the skin on my leg, and then as it started to heal, it sort of, you know, turned white at the edges, and then all of a sudden it went everywhere. I was like, wow, talk about a mechanism for damage and generalization. So I'm convinced that's what it is in, in the broad sense, and it could be sunburn. Larry. Yes, yeah, so just following up on that. Uh, there are a couple of things other than sunscreen that interact, right? UV exposure is the important one, right? And so both uh, work status, so do you work outside or not, um, and, uh, and where you live in the world uh, influence UV exposure. You look at either of those um, as, as, as possible mechanisms related to the sunscreen question? Yeah, well, I asked. So the woman up there is Stanka Berlia, um, and who worked in my lab on vitiligo for a long time. And I talked to her about this, and she said, well, you know, it could also be global warming. So people um, with global warming are wearing fewer clothes, and so they have a higher UV rate than they used to. But that would be sort of the, maybe the opposite effect. But, you know, one of the treatments for vitiligo is UV as well, but just not in burning doses um, to stimulate proliferation of melanocytes. So that relationship that you're talking about would be a complicated one, I think. Well, but the data is there for 
in a lot of cases, you would know whether somebody had an outdoor job and what the you know, oh, that's latitude, true. What the latitude was. So there's actually data you could look at um, to try and see if, if you know high UV exposure was related. Prevalence by latitude. Unfortunately, I don't know that the prevalence data exists. There was a worldwide study done of derm. Yes, sure, sure, right, as a proxy. Jen? Yeah, so I actually had more of a, more of a comment than a question, which is that you're, you're ending note on a systemic way to investigate the environment, I think, is a really interesting one. <laughs> Um, and something that uh, I learned about while I was visiting National Cancer Institute was that I guess there was recently a landmark paper showing that you can identify mutational signatures that are associated with different environmental risk factors. For <coughs> and I, I don't know much about beyond that, but I guess by saying that, I'm kind of hoping maybe that'll stir up some thoughts and, and other brilliant minds in this room that might have some ideas about if that I would suggest that somebody has been tracking some specific what they thought of as environmental risk factors and has some data. Could you repeat that question? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Jen was saying that there's been a study done at NCI that purports to find an association between certain cancer environmental risk factors and, if I understood correctly, genetic Mutational signatures, sorry. Yeah, mutational signatures that are result from. Um, and so maybe someone is or will be paying attention. David? Well, first of all, I just want to congratulate you on a incredibly impactful, successful career. Thank you. It's, it's, it's great to see your work. Um, I would like to ask you about the uh, Center for Biomedicine come back to the question of, about how to potentially probe what you have for environmental exposures. Um, you know, the problem with the environment, unlike the genome, is it's unbounded. <laughs> and uh, as complex as the genome is, the environment is even more complex. And when you think about the combinations of environmental exposures, it even comes, becomes more difficult. I, I think the key thing in terms of environment is, is personalized measures of environmental exposures. And uh, there's been a lot of progress in that realm. And there's a lot of industry-based interest in that realm. Um, but it's just emerging. Uh, the commercial potential was not nearly as evident as it was for uh, uh, defining genetics. Um, because of, it's, it's because of the complex bit associated with it. Sure. But as this relates to your your um, disease and, and, and the incredibly important findings that you have, uh, one of the ways I would approach this is I would look at the genetic clues in aggregate to try to identify the pathways that might define environmental triggers. Have you, have you approached your data in that, that way? I haven't, and I think that that's a good suggestion. Um, in all honesty, I'm not sure that I know enough about each of these 50 genes to be able to ask the right questions, um, but I would agree that's a good starting point. Uh, one point I didn't make, by the way, and, and it's sort of obvious in retrospect, um, so if you do a, all of these genome-wide association studies compare the genomes of cases of something and controls. And at least for vitiligo, what that seems to give you are genes involved in do you get disease or not? If you ask the question, do they have anything to do with clinical course given that you get disease, the answer appears to be no. So one would have to, and we would like to, go back and redo the, not redo the GWAS, reanalyze the data by, okay, taking the people who have the disease, what happened to them? Can we see genetic correlates in their clinical course? Um, because that also could involve the environment as well. Um, but I agree with you, that's a good starting place, and I haven't done it. I now, one of the uh, curious observations <clears throat> with the Eligo is that um, 
the branching lesions seem to be on parts of the body that are uh, bone, very close to the surface. So even along the spinal cord, which is not exposed to sun in most cases, you end up having uh, those lesions along the spinal cord, and certainly along the knees and the, uh, and the joints of the hand and the, and the foot and the face. Uh, so I wonder if you have any thoughts about why uh, either a small, uh, you know, fat layer or a very close proximity of the bones might encourage the lesions. Let me change your question a little bit to what can we say about the regional localization of lesions? Um, because people have thought about this a lot. And the observation is that often the vitiligo starts on extensor surfaces. People have wondered, does that mean that there's abrasion and perhaps damage and even microinfection occurring at regions of abrasion? The other thing is it's really hard to treat um, areas on extensor surfaces and especially over joints. And it turns out that you have very few melanocytes in those regions compared to other regions. And the reason for that, and this is also something that Dr. Berlia works on, is that the reservoir, the stem cell reservoir, is in hair, hair follicles. And you don't have many hairs on extensor surfaces and particularly over joints. And so when you get repigmentation in response to treatment, it's because you're stimulating proliferation of new melanocytes out of the stem cell niche that come up and out into the skin. And if you don't have many there, then you're just, whatever is going on, the balance between um, destruction and repopulation, um, it's going to be worse when, if you don't have hairs. So that's, that's the main thing that people have thought about in that regard. Ben? So, interesting, uh, we were talking about the environmental factors and how those are difficult to measure. But we've, you know, I've been carrying around my GPS to track the for the last about 10 years. Uh, a lot of people are wearing wristwatches that are tracking their heart rate, how many steps they take. There's, there's a wealth of data, actually, just the heart and personal tracking devices we're walking around. Do you think that might play to being actually able to crunch that data in? bring that in as far as at least some data around Sure. So basically, could the fact that we monitor ourselves electronically to get all kinds of information, could that be bootstrapped into some project on what our environments are doing, is doing? And the answer is, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I would choose vitiligo as the first candidate thing to study. I probably would be looking at heart disease and things like that, but Absolutely. Thank you so much. For